Today, we've got the host of the Issue Is podcast, Fox LA's Alex Michelson. Thanks for coming on. Thanks, Brian. Great to see you and uh, happy too. holidays to you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, you too. Thanks for taking time out of your holidays to, to sit down with me here. Let's jump right in. The top line of this past week was Joe Manchin going on Fox News Sunday and bailing on the Build Back Better Act. Were you surprised by Manchin's move or was this just the result of a Democratic Party that's been altogether too passive? Well, I was surprised by the way that he executed this move, <laughs> right? Uh, I mean, I think there are a lot of progressives, certainly, that thought that Joe Manchin may not be all in on Build Back Better. Uh, but to go on Fox News Sunday, a right. national show, to apparently basically give the White House almost no notice and to kind of give Joe Biden a middle finger <laughs> on national TV like that, uh, was kind of surprising and not usually something that happens uh, within one's own party. Yeah. Um, so that was surprising. Um, the, the thought, though, in terms of the substance of the negotiations is not that surprising. Joe Manchin has been expressing a lot of this throughout the entire time. I mean, he's been pretty clear on how much money he wants to spend. He's been pretty clear that he's uncomfortable with a lot of progressive uh, priorities. And it kind of feels like dating. Uh, when you're trying to get a girl or a guy that's out of your league and they're sending you signals, they're just not that into you. <laughs> like you just don't want to accept yeah. it because you really want it to work. Uh, yeah. And for some ways, you know, Joe Manchin's kind of been telling the Democratic Party progressive base, I'm just not that into you. Uh, and they just have not been uh, willing or able to accept that. And the sad reality, based off of the numbers, uh, for progressives at least, is that Joe Manchin has a tremendous amount of leverage, uh, among the most amount of leverage that any legislator has ever had in the history of the United yeah. States Senate, and that's still true today. Well, let me let me ask you a question then. We've spoken at the, about this at length. Do you think that it was a mistake for progressives? I shouldn't even say progressives because this was more like 96% of the Democratic caucus, but um, for progressives to delink Build Back Better and the infrastructure package, thereby uh, relinquishing all of their leverage. Well, you know, you and I, I think, disagree a little bit on this. Um, I think that uh, they ended up getting the worst of both worlds the way they did it. <laughs> yeah, I agree so with that. If you were going to decouple, right, and if you're going to do infrastructure on its own, the smarter strategy would have been to pass infrastructure five months ago, right after it passed in the Senate, take it right to the House, pass it, roll on the uh, momentum, have a big bipartisan signing party at the White House, make Joe Biden look like he's getting a lot done. First, he got the rescue plan done, which was historic. Now he's doing the infrastructure plan, which is historic. He looks like a big, strong, amazing, you know, FDR, LBJ kind of president. And then you use that momentum to try to negotiate Build Back Better and get the most of it that you can. That's one scenario. The other scenario is that you you have no faith in Joe Manchin, and then you keep the two things coupled until you get a vote on both of them at the same time and you've secured his vote and it's all done. That's another scenario. They did neither. Yeah. <laughs> they tried to do the second scenario, but Languish couldn't get it done, lost in Virginia, and said basically in the middle of the night on a Friday, let's uh, let's pass this thing, whatever. And, and so uh, they didn't get points on either front. <laughs> right. They didn't get points for infrastructure. And Build Back Butter right now looks dead. I mean, it may not be dead. My guess is something ends up passing, but uh, certainly not what you know the squad was looking for. Well, to that point, do you think that Build Back Better will ultimately pass? And if so, what would that bill look like? Uh, I think it looks like, I mean, if, if you need Joe Manchin to pass it, listen to what Joe Manchin is saying, and that's probably what the bill looks like, right? Yeah. Um, it is uh, picking, you know, two or three of, of the top priorities and the 150 priorities they have right now in Build Back Better. Um, and instead of, you know, paying for them for two or three years so that every interest group in the Democratic Party is happy, you pick a few priorities and, and pay for them for many years. And, and that's what it is. So what does that look like? Does that look like some sort of uh, child care? Does it look like the child tax credit? Um, it, it, from all the reporting, it seems like Joe Manchin is not particularly a fan of the child tax credit. Well, you know, the, the crazy thing about that is that he's created this arbitrary rule where everything has to last for 10 years, which had never existed before. And it's because 
you know, the, the reason, the rationale he gives is that, well, as if we're really going to just let the child tax credit go for a year or two years and then let it lapse, as if we're really going to do that. And yet, meanwhile, by virtue of allowing the Build Back Better Act to fail, the child tax credit has lapsed. So, like, actually disproving the exact point that he was trying to make. We, the, the child tax credit, as of December 15th, uh, is no longer, they're no longer sending payments out. So, so yes, the Congress does have agency in this. And if they don't pass something, this it's not just a given that these provisions are automatically gonna, gonna get renewed after, after one or two years. Yes, exactly. Well, let, let's take a very generous spin for the Democratic Party. It is possible um, that if they end up passing something, they end up with, with better legislation that's easier to sell to the American people in the end. Possible. Might not happen. But here's what I mean. Uh, build back better um, because the two parties are so different in the way that they operate, right? Republicans tend to fall in line. They like to follow the leader. Uh, and they're kind of looking for big picture stuff, not as focused on the policy weeds. Democrats don't as much like to fall in line, don't as much like to follow the leader. A lot of interest groups, a lot of different minority groups, a lot of factions that want their piece of the pie. Yeah. Um, and so the legislation when you got Democrats is different than legislation when you get Republicans. It's easier to sell, we're cutting your taxes. Easy message, right? Build back better doesn't make that much sense. What does that mean? What does that mean to me? If I'm, if I, to Joe Manchin's point, if I'm struggling right now with uh, concerned about COVID and wondering what's going to happen, are my kids' schools going to get shut down again? Are we headed to another lockdown? Are we over this? Am I going to lose my job in a vaccine mandate? You know, why are things more expensive? You know, how can government make my life a little bit easier? Like what in that plan is going to specifically help for that? There are things in that plan that do cut costs. Um, but if, if they can focus on two or three of those things that are really important, that make sense, like, for example, if it was the child tax credit, which it doesn't seem like it will be, that's pretty easy politics. We're going to give you $300 a month, every month that goes directly into your bank account. Like people can get that on a deeper, more personal level than they do roads and bridges in a few years. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, it's good politics. So if, if, if you know, the Democrats maybe need to think about pivoting and changing the messaging to make this really hit on what people are focused on right now, which are rising costs and the way that build back better or whatever you want to call it next uh, will help cut costs for American families. So I do want to pivot back to Manchin because you brought him up. You know, on one hand, if Democrats push too hard, they risk Manchin switching parties. On the other hand, look at what not pushing has gotten us, basically giving him license to walk all over Democrats and sink Build Back Better anyway. So if you were advising the Democratic Party, what's the move here? How do you bridge the gap? Uh, listen to him. <laughs> Work with him. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't think pushing him out of the party. Who wins if he's pushed out of the party? Yeah, no. Uh, uh, what's totally. the win there? Mitch McConnell, Mitch McConnell, the Senate Majority Leader. Democrats lose every single chairmanship of every committee. Yeah. Uh, they don't get his vote on on stuff that they really need. I mean, Joe Manchin certainly is not Bernie Sanders in terms of voting, but he's also not Mitch McConnell. Yeah. I mean, Joe Manchin uh, voted against Amy Coney Barrett. He voted to impeach Donald Trump. I mean, he has taken votes. Voted for the American Rescue Plan. The rescue Plan. I mean, he's taken votes that have been meaningful uh, for yeah. Democratic priorities. And he's in a state that Donald Trump won by 40 points. Um, so, uh, you know, pushing him out doesn't make sense. Although I don't think he's leaving. I mean, I, I, I think this, this uh, argument that he's going to become a Republican doesn't make sense based off of politics, which a lot of is based off of leverage. So what's Joe Manchin's leverage if he becomes the 51st senator for the Republicans? Not They're not going to need him for much of anything. Plus, yeah. he's got to go into a West Virginia Republican primary as somebody who voted to impeach Donald Trump, somebody <laughs> yeah. who voted against Amy Coney Barrett, all of those things, voted for the rescue plan, he might not even win that uh, Republican primary. And he will be far less powerful in that situation. So, I mean, is there a chance that he becomes an independent who caucuses with the Democrats? Sure. But if that happens, that really doesn't change almost anything. Um, just like Bernie Sanders hasn't been a Democrat all these years. Bigger picture, do you think this, this year was a success or a failure for both the Democrats and the Republicans? Well, 
I think in a lot of ways it was a failure for America <laughs> because we end up uh, at the end of the year um, still battling COVID and still with uh, so much division. I mean, there was, I think, hope um, that, that Joe Biden would come in and, and, you know, improve the soul of the country, which is what he wanted to do. And in a lot of ways, you know, our institutions have been strengthened. Um, there is more truth in the conversation and, and the, the heat from the White House has been taken down. The temperature has been taken down and all that, I think, is good for democracy. Uh, but um, strategically, uh, at the end of this year, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris are in a much worse position than they were a year ago. Uh, Democrats' chance for winning the House and the Senate is worse than it was a year ago. And Republicans, for um, their perspective, are in a stronger position than they were a year ago. Who do you think were the biggest winners and losers in politics this year? If you had to, if you had to pick individual people, specific people. Um, I think the biggest uh, winner in politics this year was uh, Eric Adams of New York, um, who has taken a different approach you know, and could potentially be the future of the Democratic Party, mixing a lot of things. Um, it could be a model in terms of ways to talk about crime, ways to talk about Black Lives Matter, ways to talk about um, progressivism in a sort of different way. Um, and I think he's a potential future star. Um, and I think the, the biggest loser of the year was Kamala Harris, um, who, who came into this year, you know, riding high as our country's first uh, female vice president, but um, has had a lot of um, challenges with the staff, does not have a clear um, issue that she's had a win on, um, and uh, it does not look like a, um, uh, she looks weak right now to the point where if Joe Biden doesn't run, and we were in the situation we're in right now, there would most likely be significant figures that would emerge to challenge her. She does not look like a clear heir apparent who will have an easy glide path to the nomination. Building on exactly that, and I kind of hate this question because, you know, it doesn't really make a difference what we say, but who do you think uh, is going to be is going to be the heir apparent in the Democratic Party? Who do you think that we have rising in the ranks that that would take over after Joe Biden, uh, whether it's in 2024 or 2028? Who do you think uh, who do you think's next up? Uh, the fact that there isn't an answer to that question is bad. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I don't know who the clear favorite is. I do think that if Stacey Abrams is able to win in Georgia, uh, that will be a, a tremendous uh, victory for the Democratic Party and will make her um, a automatic, you know, national figure. I mean, she's got real love and real fans behind her, whether the country is ready um, to support a black woman as, as president. You know, we will see. Let's hope that we are. Uh, there were a lot of people that were skeptical about whether we were ready to support a black man. And uh, of course, the country was so um, that, uh, you know, she's somebody uh, obviously uh, Pete Buttigieg has, you know, wanted to be president for a long time. And we'll see what happens on that front. We'll see if there are governors that, you know, who have harbored presidential ambitions for years, including. Well, I mean, no, nobody governor. knows. Uh, nobody knows a specific governor from yeah, a specific I mean, state that we both well, live in I mean, uh, better than yeah, you. I mean, Gavin Newsom, of course, who always says that he doesn't want to be president, but every indication from his entire life is that he does. <laughs> uh, and, you know, there's and there are other, you know, figures, um, you know, Andy Bashir in Kentucky. Like, there, could there be somebody like that, like in the and a red state that that has sort of a different approach that might be able to win a broader coalition. Um, who knows? I mean, do you have a favorite? Oh um, no, I think that's the safe answer here. <laughs> I think that's well, definitely and, and, the and safe that, answer. And to that point, you know, if that is still the case um, a, a year from now, um, I think there'll be tremendous pressure on Joe Biden to run again. Yeah. Um, if, if it looks like he is the best hope for the Democratic Party, um, then you know, that there will be tremendous pressure. I mean, this week he was asked by David Muir about the possibility of running against Donald Trump. And he suggested that that would make it more likely for him to run. And I think that's an honest answer. Yeah. Um, I mean, look, I, I don't, I don't make predictions. I, if, if I was able to predict the future, I think I wouldn't have sold uh, my Netflix stock when it was $85 a share. But if I had to guess, I would imagine that Joe Biden does run again in 2024. And of course, on the Republican side, I would guess as well that Donald Trump uh, would be the Republican nominee. So.
Yeah, who knows? But a lot can change in politics in a very yeah. short amount of time. I mean, we didn't see the pandemic coming a couple of years ago. And yeah. who knows if there's some sort of life changing event uh, that we're going to experience in the next year that nobody's thinking about right now. Yeah. Well, I made the mistake of I was speaking to somebody the other day and I said, well, how much worse could 2022 be? And then I stopped myself because I think I just doomed us all to, like, right. you know, yeah. all right, well, I have uh, some fun questions. Now, I thought I'd do a fun little year end wrap up. So you've been in the trenches all year. You host the five o'clock, six o'clock, seven o'clock, 10 o'clock news. Uh, you host your Friday show, The Issue Is. Uh, so what is the craziest news story that you've covered in 2021? And I want to put these back onto you as well. Okay. So I, you know, the story that I've spent more time covering than any other story as the California political guy is, of course, the California recall. But there were two moments that were just really crazy that stand out to me. One, uh, John Cox, this very rich Republican who ran last time, has run for office about 85 different times, decided what he was going to do differently this time uh, was name himself the beast <laughs> and to... <laughs> To emphasize that point, <laughs> campaign with an actual bear, yeah, <laughs> a yeah. one thousand pound bear, which he brought out onto the campaign trail, and he tried to make a policy speech with a bear roaming around next to him, and then he complained about the fact that the media spent more time focused on the bear <laughs> than on his policy speech. That yeah. was a crazy moment. Another crazy moment from the campaign trail, Caitlyn Jenner. Uh, everything about that was crazy. She did an interview with us, which was. Uh, lots of attention in terms of her sort of lack of preparation, which she admitted afterwards. Then we met up with her in Venice, where she wanted to talk about homelessness and tour the area. And her team said that they wanted us to meet up with her before the press conference, away from the rest of the press, and to do a walk and talk with her. I said, are you sure people aren't going to see this? They're like, yeah, it'll be fine. So we end up talking to her and turns out that a 6'3 woman in the middle of the street of Venice <laughs> attracts a little bit of attention. Uh, and so then we're just surrounded by press and paparazzi and homeless people and other people. We walk through, walk nearby, and during the midst of this, we walk past the Gold's Gym uh, and she says, hey, I used to work out here. Hey guys, <laughs> it's just like, what is happening? <laughs> it was so crazy. Yeah. What about you? Uh so I was I was covering something that Tucker Carlson said some insanity and he'd mentioned UFOs just as a as a fleeting thought and so I did a video I covered something that he said and I, admittedly I made fun of you know what in some fleeting moment I made fun of him referencing UFOs and a lot of people commented and they were like hey man I agreed with you on all your points except the UFO thing and I'm like a lot of people are, are coming at me on, on the UFO thing, like a lot of people, almost everybody that comments were like, hey man, ease up on the UFO stuff. And so I looked into it and I spent, and I got caught in this rabbit hole and I learned about the Phoenix lights and I think UFOs are real now. And, and so that was the craziest thing for me. That's like a whole, I mean, that turned a lot of things upside down when you don't think that aliens are real. And then, and then like 30 minutes later, you think that aliens are real. So that was, I think that was like a big thing for me that accidentally happened. So what was your favorite news story this year? Oh, I mean, there's a lot of them. I mean, I like, you know, stories of people overcoming obstacles. Um, I, the favorite person that I interviewed this year was a guy named uh, Adi Barkin, uh, who yeah. is um, living with ALS. And I've um, hosted events for the uh, ALS Golden West chapter for the last 10 years and host the Walk to Defeat ALS every year. And I'm real involved with that organization. And to meet him, somebody who is... Um, a political activist and who has lost his ability to speak using his own voice, but, you know, speaks, um, you know, using his eyeball and other things to, to, to type out answers and is one of the most uh, profound and, and um, interesting and moving and inspiring people that I've met and to be able to interview him and tell his story was, was really inspirational. Yeah, and, and I, uh, I interviewed Bradley Whitford a few weeks ago, who was the executive producer for Adi Barkin's documentary called Not Going Quietly. And I watched it and it was incredibly moving. So if anybody has some free time over the holidays, I would definitely recommend uh, watching that. Um, and of, mine's, course, watching, of course, watching Bradley in the West Wing too. Okay. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, I, I would say, you know, along the same lines, I think that for my favorite story, I think my sanity is really kept intact by the dodo watching, you know, 
those dogs getting rescued, those videos once a day. I think like that's how I need that. Like the, the, the same way that people need a cup of coffee to start their day. I need that just to like get me back to zero because there's a lot of, a lot of toxic shit that we, that we, that we trudge around in. And I think those videos are, are especially good. And I know you have a very good friend who, um, who, who, uh, who is big in uh, the animal world as well. And that's Dr. Evan Anson. When you said I needed to get back to Sandy, I thought you were going to say weed, but maybe that's... <laughs> yes, well, that too. That, 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 that definitely helps. I'm also an advocate for that. Yeah. Uh, least favorite story that, you co- that you've covered this year? Oh my God, the disinformation yeah. and people's just unwillingness to listen to any rationality uh, when it comes to masks or vaccines or anything. I mean, there's such extremism on both sides where the, the, the virtue signaling is absurd. You know, there's some Democrats that seem to be walking around in hazmat suits, uh, afraid of coronavirus. And there's some Republicans that like literally go to COVID parties to try to get themselves yeah. sick. And like, come on, people, let's actually follow the science. Let's be rational about this and let's move on because I'm so sick of this shit. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> amen. Uh, mine, was, mine was the insurrection on January 6th. It was- Oh, it yeah. Was, it was the only time that I felt like history was happening while it was happening. And I don't, I don't do a lot of live streams on my YouTube channel. I jumped on that live stream and, and covered it for the entirety of the day just because I, I didn't know how else to do it. I couldn't do my regular five minute summary of it. It wouldn't do justice to it. And so I kind of uh, watched everything unfold as I was, as I was covering it live, which, which is unusual for me, but I just, you know, I could tell that that was, that was a monumental event. I, you know, I, I pride myself on trying to keep my composure while anchoring. And on that day, I was the angriest I think I've ever been and, uh, and spent, I had about 10 minutes in between shows and I wrote a commentary and I watched it back recently and it was about as blistering and as intense as I've ever been on the air yeah. because that, the emotions of that was, was so palpable. What do you wish would have happened this year? Oh my, that people would have, you know, come together to try to defeat this thing. It seems like, you know, when we started off in March, 2020, there was, you know, some sense of unity, let's get through this COVID thing together. And then it just became so political and so acrimonious. And I think that's been bad for everybody. What do you think? I feel like, you know, I feel like you could guess what I wish would have happened in politics this year. What, that Joe Biden would have been a little stronger and fought back a little more? Well, not exactly. I mean, I mean, yes, absolutely. But <laughs> but uh, the topic I've covered, I think, more than anything, is the filibuster. I wish Democrats oh. could have eliminated the filibuster, made this a banner year, gotten out of their own way. And you, granted, there's there's still time for next year, but it's hard not to feel like this year wasn't a missed opportunity. And so I, I wish we could have uh, I wish we could have seen the filibuster get eliminated. Well, there is an argument to be made. Um, and and I, I heard recently that, that Bill Clinton made an argument in 2010 to the Democrats um, that were on the fence about Obamacare, um, that in 1994, when they were struggling to pass health care, they ended up not passing it and everybody lost. Um, and he said, if you're going to lose anyways, why not pass it and get the legislative win and help people? Yeah. Um, and, you know, in some ways, what happened with the Democrats this year was more like 1994. Um, if you're going to lose, why not lose on something that you believe on in and right. you know, pick a hill to die on? And um, they haven't done that. From your lips to Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema's ears. Uh, <laughs> let's finish up with this. What are your goals for next year, both personally and for the country? Uh, to spend personally to, to try to get a little more balance and... <laughs> able to take some time away from this stuff because it's yeah. amazing how much happier you are sometimes away from this stuff. Um, and uh, and for the country, I hope that there is um, a, a little more uh, listening and uh, a little more realization that we're not that, that different and there are values that unite us and um, that we can get back away from some of this meanness and get away from the civil war. <laughs> I don't know if that's possible. That's my hope. What about yeah. you? Yeah. Uh, I think uh, definitely, definitely, definitely what you said, I would, uh, I would echo just to try to try to get a little bit better of a work life balance. I mean, especially, you know, going into January of this year between the insurrection, the impeachment trial, uh, the election theft saga, all of that stuff. I mean, it's, it's hard not to throw yourself in. I mean, I found myself working 14, 15, 16 hours a day. Uh, (laughs) I know in the beginning of the year, I would, I would read a lot of my YouTube comments. And a lot of people, you know, by January would say like, hey, man, 
you don't look so good. I think you need to take some take some time off. Uh, like make sure you're taking care of yourself. And I'm like, man, everyone's so critical online, just getting up in my business. And uh, and it turns out that I had lost uh, 10 pounds. <laughs> so, I mean, wow. I, you, don't I, have, I, you don't have 10 pounds to lose. No, I, mean, I didn't have to, but I, but I did. And yeah. Uh, so, so yeah, I mean, in, in retrospect, looking back, definitely want to try to take care of myself a little bit better. Another one was to try to reach young people. I've, I've recently launched my show on Snapchat too. And I think that there's a lot to be said of, of trying to, to you know, spread a factual message to to people who who are a less likely to vote and b less uh, solidified in their positions. My, yeah. And uh, one of my things is to to get involved, learn how to do TikTok, learn yeah. how to do Reddit, learn how to get into some of these other spaces, and to go where people are. And we've seen that. I just did this year end interview with Arnold Schwarzenegger where he handed out um, homes to tiny homes to vets uh, in West Los Angeles and worked with his team and sharing it in a lot of different places. And it's amazing to see all the different places where people get their information. Yeah. Um, and so I think it's on all of us to try to reach people where they are. That's what, you know, Pete Buttigieg's uh, staff, Liz Smith, would say so often and why I think he ended up doing so much better than expected. And um, I want to try to figure that out too. It's hard. It's complicated. And if anybody yeah. wants to give me some advice or follow me in any of those places, feel free. I could use all the help I can get. Yeah, you and me uh, trying to figure out TikTok will nothing will make us feel older than 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 this uh, journey we're about to embark upon. And I, I think um, for the country, I would like obviously to see the Democrats hold the House and expand our Senate majority. And uh, obviously, I'm pushing for that through the Don't Be a Mitch Fund. Another goal is to to continue raising money. I think we're up to seven hundred thousand dollars in the Don't Be a Mitch Fund. So I'd like to I'd like to hit. Um, one and a half million to for voter registration groups in a bunch of key swing states. If anybody listening or watching feels like donating, the link to that is in the show notes here. Um, with that said, Alex, thank you again for taking time away from your holidays and uh, Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, Happy New Year, and uh, and thank you for for you know all the time that you've given me this past year. Well, hi, I'm my friend. <laughs> Happy holidays to everybody listening. Uh, you got a great platform here. It's been a, a pleasure to sort of see it grow from the beginning and you've really turned it into something great. Um, so thank you very much for letting me be a small part of it and my best to you and your family.